All right, we're live. Um, today, uh, so welcome to the first episode of Time Machine for Entrepreneurs. This is a podcast where uh, we're basically going to dig into um, learning things about uh, other entrepreneurs uh, and kind of things that, uh, you know, just gain some insight into their worlds and pick up some tips along the way that hopefully we can all apply to our own businesses and our own worlds. Uh, our first guest today, Jeremy Gonzalez, is my partner in business. Um, Jeremy and I met roughly a year ago, and f funny backstory, we only met for the first time uh, in real life after we've been in business for about a year, only met in real life about two weeks ago. Uh, you know, kind of the running joke was with Jeremy's wife was, you know, is this guy even real? Uh, I kind of the same thing on my side, but the, the way Jeremy and I connected, uh, we are both in a mentorship together called Sub2 with Pace Morby. Um, we were both running separate businesses and uh, I essentially was, you know, struggling in my own business, kind of getting to a certain point where I was stuck. I, you know, simply put a post in the group and that's how Jerry and I, Jeremy and I connected. Um, I was good, you know, in the real estate side of things, that's our business, at generating leads. Um, I was falling short on the closing side and Jeremy, uh, you know, has had a, had a partner before I did, uh, had a successful real estate investing business before COVID. Uh, and came in and filled a lot of the gaps in my world um, so that, you know, we've been able to, to grow and have a, a successful partnership together. Um, but the reality is uh, we're running separate sides of the business. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of the business that I still don't know and probably never will know. So I'm actually fascinated with, with, with part of what Jeremy's doing every day, um, how he got here, how he got so good at what he's doing. Um, and uh, I'm sure he's got some gems for you guys as well, whether you're partnerships or you're going at this alone. Um, so let's start. Uh, Jeremy, how, uh, well, well, tell us a little bit. G give me some backstory. Uh, I know you started, I believe you were in medical sales, right? Yeah. So actually, before medical sales, uh, I spent eight years on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Okay. So, you know, I was dealing with investment bankers and hedge funds, uh, very high level very intense people. Um, <laughs> then once the wow. Wall Street, once the Wall Street world sort of dried up, um, got into medical device sales. So, um, you know, you would think they're very, very different careers, Wall Street, then medical device, now real estate investing. Um, but the thing that I kind of learned from each of those careers that I think has me uniquely suited to do what I do, what I do now is... I can have very high level conversations, very intense conversations with all different sorts of people and remain calm and just kind of have the ability to get them to uh, feel comfortable with me. And that's kind of, that's kind of always been my secret sauce with, with sellers uh, is just that, you know, we, they can, a lot of times they yell at us on the phones and they, they you know, we're the bad guy. But then when you, you actually sit on their couch with them and have a real conversation with them, um, they realize that, hey, we're just problem solvers and we're here to see if we can help. And we don't always help. Uh, we help when we can. And uh, yeah, it's it's been an interesting journey in real estate for me. Um, I've done a little bit of a lot of things and that's not exactly uh, the path I would suggest you take it unfortunately as a path a lot of us take you know in this industry there's a lot of ways to make money and that's kind of a bad thing so i've dabbled in purchasing raw land i have done some light fix and flips i have done some a little bit heavier fix and flips i've done creative finance um and it wasn't until recently that you know dave and i decided to get ultra focused and um just dial in on what we do that we start to truly have success. You just generated a whole new series of questions. I, I wish I wrote down. Um, tell me, um, Wall Street to medical sales to real estate. Was there anything specific that sparked it? Um, and, and you drew a couple of parallels there on, on why you're able to be successful at all of them. Um, is there anything kind of teachable that you can pass on from that? I mean, it seems, you know, building rapport with people, being having good communication skills, being a problem solver uh, seems to have carried over for you across a couple of things. Is that something that came naturally? Is that something that, 
you know, you had mentors, like where does that all come from in your life? Uh, honestly, it's experience. Um, it's, you know, starting off in Wall Street with, like I said, very, very high level uh, investors that are, you know, every, every time they pick up the phone and call me, they have millions of dollars on the line. So if you make very small mistakes, it costs a lot of money and um, it's intense. You get yelled at a lot. And the more you get yelled at, the thicker your skin becomes. And the more you understand how to handle that and you start to learn personalities. Um, and then, you know, when I was in medical device sales, I was dealing with, you know, orthopedic spine surgeons, neurosurgeons. These are very, very, very brilliant people, very intense people, alpha personalities, very difficult to deal with a lot of them. Um, and, you know, I still had to do my job. I can get screamed at in the operating room one minute and then the next minute I've got to be standing two feet away from the surgeon and answering a question about a product. So, uh, yeah, over time, you just sort of understand that, like, we're literally just having conversations with people. And every, every person has a different career and every person is just has a different personality. But at the end of the day, we're all just people. And if you can just kind of keep that in the back of your mind and just have a real conversation, you know, we have new investors that we talk to on a daily basis. And that's one of the things I try to remind all of them about. You're just having conversations, you know, don't worry about a script. Don't worry how you answer something. If you're having a real conversation, you'll solve people's problems. So, so a theme here, it sounds like you like getting yelled at a lot. <laughs> I, I don't, but I'm, I'm, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm really good at getting yelled at. <laughs> it seems you're really good at getting yelled at. Uh, so let's go into a story then. Um, what is, so in, in your latest career in real estate, um, I, I, let's give, you know, people an insight. Cause obviously for anyone getting into this, they're going to go through this themselves as well. How do you handle it? Let, let's go through a good story on, on, you know, a real special one. Someone that really kind of laid into you and how did you handle it? And were you able to kind of turn them around or, you know, is that even possible in every situation? Um, okay. So I, I don't know that I can think of a specific seller who like threw me out of a property. Um, but I would say that people go through whatever they're going through in life. And we kind of come along as investors and we reach out to sellers and we don't have any idea what kind of day they're having. Right. They may have just lost their job. They may have had, you know, their dog just passed away or who knows what they're going through in their life. And we call them and they're having a really terrible day and they just lay into us. And it's not because who we are. It's not because they know us and they don't like us. It's because we happen to get in front of them at the wrong time and they were going to lay into someone. So, you know, I've seen numerous times with a lot of other uh, newer investors who kind of, you know, come to us for some advice that like, hey, if, if you just you can you can literally call them up tomorrow and they could be as nice as as pie to you because they just they they probably forgot that they even yelled at you the day before. Um, so, you know, I, I would love to give you an exact example that I've been through on that, but I don't have one that really sticks out where I got thrown off a property, unfortunately. It's probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> no major threats. No, uh, no one stalking you on social media. Uh, the closest I ever had was um, a, a gentleman who decided that I was such an inconvenience that I sent him a text message that he decided to message me every 10 seconds for about five hours. <laughs> And what do you do in that situation? Um, I completely ignored him. And then eventually he said, okay, I'm done now. Don't ever text me again. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know when you caught him. He just kind of had to have his way. He did. Yeah. I let him do his thing and then he stopped. Cool. So in, in our business, you essentially run uh, the acquisitions and closing side. Um, for someone else who's trying to do this business completely on their own, uh, is it possible to run both sides of the business in your opinion? It's possible. Yes. It's not scalable. Why not? Um, there, if you want to scale, there are too many systems you have to have in place and there are too many moving parts to do them well enough. Um, you would have to put together a big team of maybe virtual assistants 
if you wanted to be a solopreneur, but you wouldn't truly be doing it on your own. You'd still be building a team. So whether you wanted to have a partner to help with certain parts of the business, or you just wanted to hire people to handle parts of the business, um, there aren't enough hours in the day to truly look at your data, to pull lists, to analyze data, to reach out to sellers, to communicate with sellers, get properties under contract, get them into escrow, take it to closing, find a buyer, right? There's just too many things for you to do um, without driving yourself absolutely mad, which is what happens to a lot of uh, solopreneurs. You, not saying they go mad, but um, it becomes a really lonely game. You just kind of have your head down and you're grinding and grinding and looking around and like, who's going to come and steal my business? Um, and it's hard to have a, an abundance mindset. You have sort of get stuck in this scarcity mindset of like, I need to do everything myself and I need to keep it all and to have all the money. And it just becomes hard to, uh, to handle every aspect of the business efficiently and, and get to the point where you're doing more than, you know, one to three deals a month. So you mean I can't just make 10 phone calls and go make $10,000 a month just like that on my own? Uh, you could. <laughs> you could. If you, were lucky, if you were lucky enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not saying people haven't made money on their first phone call, but it's not realistic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, would you say there's any um, kind of false expectations uh from the current state of the real estate industry based on what you've been through? I mean, this has been a journey for you. How, how long ago when you find, like first got into real estate? Yeah, so I started um, committing mentally to it about seven or so years ago. And by that, I mean, you know, every spare moment I was listening to a podcast or reading a book about real estate investing, uh, spent the first two, plus years in the whole analysis paralysis stage, just gathering information. Um, but what I would say from learning all that and, and, you know, listen to, I don't know, 20 or 30 different podcasts, reading 20 or 30 different books about real estate investing. Um, the common trend that you start seeing uh, the information that's being conveyed to newer investors is just what you said. Like, Oh, oh, I can make, I can make a phone call. I can make five phone calls and get a check for $10,000. You know, like that one, that one person that they had on their interview, um, that, that had that experience, that's great, but they don't talk about the, you know, 4,000 other wholesalers that started wholesaling this month that haven't got even a single person to talk to yet, let alone a deal. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't think the industry does a very good job with setting, uh, the expectations of what how difficult this industry truly is. Um, and, you know, I've heard other, other people say that it's not that this business is, is hard, but it is difficult. So um, by that basically means like, you know, yes, there's, there, there's plenty of roadmaps out there to tell you like you need to do X, Y, and Z, but being in the business every single day and, and going out there and doing the things you need to do on a daily basis um, it takes a lot of effort to stay consistent and do that. Two things. Uh, number one, I want to touch on the analysis paralysis. Um, that seems to be a common thread for a lot of entrepreneurs. Was there anything specific that helped you get over that? Um, I think there's always a certain degree of analysis paralysis, uh, even today. Um, I think as you dip your toe in the water more with investing and it can be that way with any new venture you're going to take in your life um you want to feel like you know what you're doing i think a lot of a lot of uh wholesalers want to feel confident in talking to a seller because you're gonna maybe you're gonna get asked questions you don't know the answer to and you're scared of that um so again it comes down to some experience and then just going out there and doing it just take action So first time you called a seller, what happened? Do you remember back that far? No, I think the first um, the first time was inbound. So that was when I was I was buying land, 
And uh, I was just literally sending out offers and then these angry people would call me back like, you're not buying my land. And I was, I didn't know what to say. Like, why are you so mad at me? Why <laughs> I didn't do it. You have to sell me your land. I was just asking if you were interested. Um, so what does the land game look like? Let, let's walk through the land game versus what you're doing now. Um, yep. Wholesaling. Yeah. So the land game is pretty, it's pretty simple. Um, it's a good way to dip your toe into creative finance, actually, because all we do is send out a bunch of mailers to buy vacant raw land in the middle of nowhere, you know, buying a lot of land in Nevada, buying land in Oregon, buying land in, you know, these areas like Arizona, um, where it's just literally just buying desert a lot of times. And you're buying five acres, 10 acres, 20 acres, and, um, you know, we'll buy it for 10 cents on the dollar. And then we'll turn around and we'll sell it for full price and we'll sell or finance it. So it just creates that passive income and you'll, you know, you'll get your, if you bought it for a thousand bucks, you might get a thousand dollars down and then, you know, a hundred bucks a month for the next five years, something like that. So, so I'm a numbers guy. So let's, let's walk through marketing to, to raw land. What does that look like? You, you said you're doing mailing, like what kind of budget would someone need? No, let's just say they're starting as a new investor from scratch right now and they decide that sounds like an interesting route to go. Where do they start? Like, where do they learn how to invest in land? What kind of budget do they need? What kind of time frame to get a deal? What kind of, you know, ROI can they get on that? Like, what, what does all that look like? Um, so I've been out of that game for a few years, so I can't really tell you what sort of ROI you're going to expect to get. But um, basically, we would send out letters so each letter cost a dollar or so to send out and you'd send out a couple thousand so it's going to cost you a couple thousand dollars to dip your toe in the game and then hopefully you start getting calls right and when you get those calls you've got to have um some sort of way to answer them so if you have like a call rail account maybe so that's 45 dollars a month um and, and those are really some of your only expenses. Now, once you start getting deals, you've got to do things that, that are going to cost a little bit of money. Um, but it's a, it's a relatively um, low barrier to entry. So calculations on raw land versus single family home. Like how are you comping raw land? What does that look like? You, it, you just look at comps. That's it. You look at what pieces of raw land have sold in the area. Anything to any kind of pitfalls to look out for on raw land that people should know about? Yeah, the, the number one thing, um, obviously clear title. And uh, once you know your title is clear, the only other issue you could have would be uh, it being landlocked. So, you know, so my, and, and certain certain areas, um, certain parts of the country, even landlocked properties ha automatically have right away. Uh, but there are some areas where you're truly landlocked and you're, you're going to have a hard time selling it. Landlocked meaning you need egress. You need access to it. Correct. From the road. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my quick understanding on land is that the two ways that you make money is you subdivide it or you rezone it. Um, it sounds like you're, so when you're buying it, are you buying larger parcels that you can then subdivide and sell off individual lots? So like for round numbers, if you're buying at 10 cents on the dollar, you have a hundred thousand, um, you know, however, 10 acre lot, uh, you're dividing it up into, uh, and you can get it for, for 10,000. You're dividing it up into 10 lots, selling them each for a thousand. You got your principal back, uh, but well, you're not selling them for a thousand. Maybe you're selling them for 5,000. You're taking a thousand down and you're selling seller financing the balance to take a return on it. Is that kind of what that looks like? Um, I really wasn't doing any subdividing. Um, the, the land that we were buying, you wouldn't want to really want to subdivide that because, um, People want, you know, multiple acres when you're in the middle of nowhere. The people that buy out there, they're generally looking for privacy. Um, so it was not, these aren't pieces of land that you're really going to build anything on. So you know, there's, even within the, just the land game, there's so many different niches in it. And this was truly just like vacant desert land. So I didn't plan on going down the land direction, but I was fascinated because I, you know, didn't know how much you were going into that before. Uh, in our yeah. business right now, we're predominantly wholesaling single family homes. Um, what would be the biggest bottleneck you're facing in right now is you went from, um, you know, as we're scaling this business, what do you see as a bottleneck 
um, going from doing, call it a deal a month to trying to get to like a deal a week, um, to try and get to say 10 deals a month. Um, systems. And it's a cop out answer probably, but, um, having the systems in place that we have been putting in place for the past few months, um, having a lead manager that can handle, you know, vetting the leads that come through from the VAs that way I'm not spending eight hours a day underwriting deals that are never going to be a deal. Um, I only see the deals that come through that actually make sense financially. Um, and then the next bottleneck from there is going to be, um, actually getting transaction coordinator uh, because coordinating the transactions is taking up a majority of my day. And that's where, that's where most of the headaches are. So, so why scale? What, what's the point of scaling? Um, well, we can't really have a long lasting thriving business if we don't scale. Right. If you if you're only doing one deal a month, maybe you can get by. But what happens when the market shifts a little bit and then all of a sudden you drop by 50 percent? Now you have a half deal a month. Um, you know, if we if we get to the point where we're doing 10 deals, 20 deals a month and something changes and we have to scale back to, say, 10 deals a month or eight deals a month, um, we can still continue to keep the lights on and have a good business. And then it gives us the ability to pivot if we need to. So you're constantly setting yourself up for whatever could happen in the market. Yeah, because, um, you know, once in a while, things change. So, so let's talk about the, the current. <laughs> uh, you know, I, that, that basically everyone says that real estate runs in cycles. I think it's roughly a 14-year cycle. Is that accurate? Like it's neither well, of them in it long enough to fully. Yeah, no, I mean, who knows what the current one is going to be. But I know we're, we're overdue. It's supposed to be every 10 or so. And we're way past it. Interesting. Um, what? Uh, so, so I want to backtrack a little bit again. Uh, going back to um, to the analysis paralysis. Um, yep. And the, mind, and the mindset game. I know our mentorship in sub two right now is really putting a lot of focus on mindset. Uh, anything that's worked for you or any tips to give uh, to someone starting out that can kind of help get over like mindset issues? Yeah, I think the very first one, um, and I don't think anybody really told me this when I was starting out, is make sure you like doing the things you decide to do. Right. And that, and that plays into the fact that like, you know, it's not a great idea to be a solopreneur in this business because there are a lot of parts of this business that you probably don't enjoy. So if, if there are, you know, 10 things in a day that I need to do and I know that I don't enjoy five of them, those five are going to get done last if at all. Right. So if, if I knew those five were the only five things that I had to do and I didn't like them, then that's where I think analysis paralysis is going to play in. And I'm like, well, I don't enjoy talking to sellers, so I'm not going to make this phone call because I'm probably going to get yelled at and I want to play the conversation through in my head 25 times to make sure I've figured out every scenario that could possibly happen before I make that phone call. But now it's just about lunchtime. So I should probably go have lunch. And then after lunch, well, I have to go pick my son up at school in like an hour. So I don't want to make the call now, you know? So I think if you're, if you know in your business that, that you're not the one that likes talking to sellers and having those conversations, then find someone that that does enjoy that right and whether it's partnering up or it's just outsourcing it um but you know one of the uh like you know you and i both just reread who not how and awesome, that that exactly explains that perfectly just find find someone that enjoys doing what you don't want to do and can take it off your plate so you can do more productive things um, and that will eliminate or reduce the amount of analysis paralysis you've got. Cause if you love doing something, you're not going to, you're not going to wait or hesitate doing it. 
what, what I love about that book too, is it really kind of hit home how, um, how much something costs you uh, in not kind of taking it off your plate and giving it to someone else who's inspired to do it or who can pay to do it. Um, it's costing you way more in like lost opportunity, um, keeping it on your plate than it would be to like take on like the expense of hiring someone and be like, all right, now I'm responsible for this, but I know it's getting done. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, the exact situation in our business, um, I mean, you know, what did you and I do all day, every day for months? You handled data and I handled every inbound lead that came in and, we, and I underwrote all day long. And we had, we had no time to try and work on growing the business and truly building the business and making sure our systems were in place. It wasn't until we started finding the who, not how, and, you know, promoted one VA to data manager, promoted one VA to lead manager, took that off our plates. And now we can focus on going out and working with other investors. And we can focus on trying to, to um, get our systems to a point where we can be more efficient and we can try and scale. I heard on another podcast recently, um, you know, those are $4 an hour tasks. Yeah. A, a lot of things that the quickest things to take off your plate are those, you know, quote unquote, $4 an hour tasks, uh, mm -hmm. something you can pay a, a VA to do. And, you know, even not having the budget, you know, the reason I'm saying it's costing you more to not hire that person. Once you hire that person, now you're going to do what it takes to get things done to make sure like you're, you're responsible for putting food on that person's table every night, essentially. Like, you now have an employee who de depends on you running your business like a professional. Um, and so taking those lower priority activities off your plate allows you to do the things that, like you said, that you really love. So that being said, what do you love about what you do? Why real estate? What is it you love about this? Um, yeah, those are two different questions. Um, <laughs> why real estate? I think it's pretty well known across the world that uh, you can make more money in real estate than you can doing anything else. Um, and the freedom that is provided, the potential to have freedom, I should say, that's provided by, um, you know, just being an entrepreneur in general versus working a normal nine to five job, um, is just kind of fits with the way my brain's wired. I'm not, a, I'm not a nine to five sitting in a cubicle guy. I can't do it. An, if you're an entrepreneur, you're an entrepreneur, but like, you know, you could have chose anything. Yeah. Um, what, what is it that led you to real estate? Um, you know, is it a podcast, podcast? <laughs> no, it really was. I, I actually don't know um, exactly what it was, but I know it was about 20 something years ago. Uh, and I had forgotten about this completely. There was uh, maybe five or six years ago, I was looking through my bookshelf and I found a stack of books that I bought at a real estate seminar like 25 years ago. Wow. And I remember I was, I went to this seminar and they were, you know, it was over my head. I didn't know what they were talking about, but I knew they were talking about like pre foreclosures and going and knocking on doors and solving people's problems. And I thought that was really cool, but I didn't have any idea how to go and do it. And these books just sat on my shelf for years. Um, so then when I was getting out of uh, medical device sales, I knew that like, the, the clock was ticking. I had you know, a couple of years left of medical device sales before I was going to either have to completely change my business, find a totally new product to sell, or I was going to make a change and go do something else. Um, and I just, you know, maybe it's because HGTV has so many shows on real estate investing. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but I knew I liked it and I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, but the, you know, the one thing I wasn't, so sure on is exactly what niche I wanted to be in. Any, uh, what were those books? Was there a Robert Allen in there? No, I don't, I don't even know if I have them around anymore. Um, no, I don't think I do. I'm trying to do my, they might be in a box somewhere. Um, <laughs> it was like all done by that. Whoever the course was, they, it was like a series of books came in a package. Um, it was like, I don't know, five or six of them. It was about like, you know, a banking book and about loans and all. it was like all, all of how book on pre foreclosures and all, I don't know, 
I don't know what they were. I know I didn't read them 25 years ago. If I had, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I'd be in a, on an island somewhere probably. <laughs> so, so seven years in, what what keeps you doing this every day? What do you love? Um, I love solving problems, um, whether it's ours or sellers' problems. Um, I love the opportunity, you know, the 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 thought of there being opportunity and trying to figure out how to go after it. It's uh, you know, it's kind of like a big game, and you're just constantly trying to figure out how to build the business and find more sellers and get more, more deals under contract. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm never bored. That, that's, that's true. You'll never get bored in this industry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're seven years in, um, you've been through a bunch, you've started in land, you're doing single family. Now you have a team, you're scaling, uh, looking back, uh, seven years ago, what advice would you give yourself? This is kind of, this is where the podcast comes from. This is kind of like our, our final question. Um, it, it's, we call it the time machine because, you know, we want to look back and give ourselves, our, our younger selves advice that would help us kind of, um, you know, fast track to where we are now. So what does that look like for you? Yeah. Um, I think the most glaring thing um, that sticks out in my mind is, just be consistent. Uh, you know, don't jump around from strategy to strategy and give each strategy enough time to work because the secret to this industry is that all the strategies work. You just need to stay focused on it and give it enough time and enough effort to get through the first 30, 60, 90, 120 days of that strategy for the marketing train to get going and pick up momentum. And then from there on, you should be good. But it's when you're chasing that squirrel and constantly looking at the shiny objects, um, there will always be a new strategy. They will always be sexy strategies. And yes, they all work. So if I could have just told myself a long time ago, like, all right, you're going to pick one and you're going to stick to it until you've mastered it. And then if you want to add another strategy, at, only at that point, can you switch? Awesome advice. We, we've made those, you know, we've made those mistakes ourselves. It, it yeah. took us a while to figure that out. And, you know, truer words couldn't have been said. <laughs> the biggest challenge in real estate is there's so many ways to be successful in real estate and all yeah. of them work. <laughs> yep. Um, awesome advice. Awesome chat. Um, yeah, I guess uh, anything you want to, uh, anything I, I didn't ask that you'd like to address? No, no, I think, uh, I think, I think we're good. Um, I think we kind of went over everything we wanted to talk about. So, uh, you know, this is an awesome first podcast. And uh, thank you for for hosting this one. Uh, it turns <laughs> up next, so uh, I guess I'm next. <laughs> yeah, that was that was great. That was great. Thanks, Dave. Cool, cool. Thanks everyone who at some point watches this. We're not live, uh, but thank you for tuning in. And uh, we're gonna be learning as we go, so these will get better. But you know, our goal is really to find uh, guests that we really want, that kind of know something we don't, and we want to pick up some gems for ourselves, and hopefully be able to share that wisdom with you all. So, um, you know, we're looking forward to growing this and uh, meeting some really interesting people and uh, getting some really interesting insight for everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you.